Well, hi everyone. Welcome to this global hangout. Today we're having a conversation about coronavirus and we're talking about the misinformation out there surrounding COVID-19, uh, myth busting as well. And to do that, I'm joined from Italy by Manlio Di Domenico. Hello, Elena. Uh, I am a physicist and my lab is currently tracking the online discussion about uh, misinformation on COVID-19, tracking millions of tweets. Now, in the Netherlands, we have with us today Marit Shishaka. Hi, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm in Amsterdam now uh, to stay in quarantine, but I normally divide my time between Stanford University in California, where I live, and the Cyber Peace Institute, where I'm the president and which is located in Geneva. And from both places, I look at trust, uh, resilience of democracy, and how the online environment and business models play a role in that. And in the UK, Ellie Kemp. Hi, yes, I'm Head of Crisis Response for Translators Without Borders. We've been um, monitoring social media feeds in a number of Asian languages in particular and working with others to send out myth-busting information in a range of languages to reach as far as possible. Well, right off the bat then, guys, um, perhaps I want to ask you, as you've been tracking this, as you've been researching, many of the myths or misinformation are out there about coronavirus. Uh, what is perhaps some of the strangest information that you've come across, uh, the craziest examples, or you know, even things that just really worry you? I think there's quite a lot that's worrying. Um, it, it, it's a, largely in our experience so far, it's been about people um, suggesting possible cures or, or ways of preventing the virus. I think my favorite one so far has been inhaling onions and keeping onions by the bed when you go to sleep. That is definitely not true. Um, has anybody else, <laughs> anything else out there they're especially worried about? Well, I think the geopolitical battle for the narrative about what is actually going on. So where the virus first appeared, how it spread across the world, whether authorities took their responsibility is one that is coming from the top. You know, we have a real interest, for example, coming from China in changing the narrative about what their role is, uh, whether they have taken their responsibility or not. And surely there is a big PR machine uh, rolled out now. So I think what's really important to keep in mind is that disinformation often comes from the top. Uh, and we've also seen false claims being made by President Trump in this context, which is actually very, very problematic. I just want to jump in and briefly ask you uh, the difference between uh, misinformation and disinformation, because uh, we should probably get that straight, right? Sure. So I think it's about uh, the difference between whether there's a, a claim on something like, you know, uh, that is false or whether there's a whole um, strategic agenda behind eroding trust in liberal democracy as such, sowing confusion, overloading people's timelines with so much information that they are really unable to navigate it anymore. The World Health Organization has spoken of an infodemic in this context, which is spreading faster than the virus itself, but it is actually at least as uh, dangerous. So we should not underestimate the danger of what disinformation, false claims, uh, commercially driven or politically driven manipulation can actually lead to. And Leo, I saw you nodding along to uh, some of that. Um, what are your thoughts? So I, I perfectly agree. Uh, <clears throat> with what has been said so far. And actually what we are, have been trying to do was to uh, monitor and also to quantify to which extent users on Twitter specifically, because Twitter allows us to access uh, uh, the public conversation about, uh, about this topic. And we have been trying to quantify uh, the exposure of users to, to this information. And actually, I have to add that uh, I am worried by, um, let's say, misinformation, uh, mostly because uh, um, we have seen this, uh, what we call now in our jargon with my colleagues, uh, the it's a flu bro effect. And uh, it's just by it's minimizing the relevance of this epidemi epidemic from the very beginning, and now instead that uh, uh, it exploded to the war, uh, <clears throat> world, uh, we, have, we are seeing the politicians and uh, uh, our leaders uh, starting to realize what they have done. And we have seen this with the data. 
So we have, from the analysis of these millions of tweets, for instance, uh, in, uh, in Italy, we have seen how the epidemic uh, wave arrived just after the infodemic wave. So we make this distinction. And from a mathematical perspective, because I am a physicist, the laws behind the two processes are exactly the same. So the math is very, very similar. And uh, we have seen that uh, the, the Italian people were um, sharing a lot of unreliable content before the arrival of the epidemic. But when we had the very first uh, outbreak of more or less 20 people in Lombardy, that now is the epicenter in Italy, um, we had the, um, the official press release by the government um, that uh, attempted to uh, provide us with uh, the real risk of, uh, uh, of this virus. And everything changed. So the amount of uh, uh, shared uh, unreliable content uh, dropped dramatically and the amount of reliable content, so uh, mainstream media and scientific sources, uh, increased uh, uh, very fast. So I and see, sorry to interrupt. I can yeah. see some people nodding along there with what you're saying, and I'm wondering if they want to just uh, jump in and say what they've been experiencing from their end on that. Well, sometimes it's hard to imagine that in a crisis like this, where we should all stand together and really feel responsibility for what each of us can do to stop the spread of, his, of this deadly virus, that there's also people who see an opportunity to exploit the fear, who are really thinking long and hard about what might be the best email to send people that they would then click on because they think it has urgent updates about the coronavirus, for example, which in turn will cause downloading of malware or some kind of attack that could be organized by criminals. So we should not underestimate the cynical way in which bad actors are trying to exploit this moment of fear or what the agenda might be behind what was shared about, you know, downplaying the risk and the consequences of that, because um, it really has devastating effects on the trust in authorities, you know, whether people were well informed, whether people were warned for the risks that they were incurring. And I think that this question of trust in experts, trust in authorities is a crucial one right now. And uh, we have to identify that there are bad actors trying to erode that trust because they want to break up our societies anyway. And they see coronavirus and all the pain and hurt that goes along with it as an opportunity for their own uh, well, uh, purposes, let's say. Well, talking about, you know, trust and uh, who we can trust in all of this. I mean, we at uh, our ver verification team here, uh, NBC, has also been uh, looking into that. And we certainly came uh, across uh, one occasion, at least, uh, when inaccurate information had a very uh, serious consequence and I want to bring in now uh, Rory Arrow. Now Rory is our executive producer from the verification team and uh, he can tell us a little bit more about exactly uh, what that team found. Rory? Uh, well you might remember that President Trump has been talking about various treatments that might be a breakthrough in the treatment of COVID-19 and one of those he talks about was a substance called chloroquine. Now that's normally a drug that's used to treat malaria. You may have taken it when you go on holiday to a remote place. That, is, that drug is uh, certified by the FDA for treatment of malaria but it's not yet certified for treatment of COVID-19. Now, lots of people obviously listened to that announcement, and we believe that some of them may have taken the wrong drug in response to that. There was one man in Arizona who took a substance he thought was chloroquine and actually died as a result. The substance he really took was a substance that is used to treat fish ailments in aquariums. Now, we at the Verification Center wanted to find out if that was just a one-off. And unfortunately, what we found was quite shocking. Online retailers of this substance, chloroquine, which, it, which in its form where it's used to treat fish is called chloroquine phosphate powder, sales and um, demand for that substance online have actually surged in online retailers showing that perhaps this, this man was not a one-off and people are buying a very dangerous product. Now, we've got with us Mark Valderrama, who's the owner of the aquarium store Depot, and he had exactly this experience, a surge in demand for this highly toxic uh, product. 
Mike, can you tell us uh, your experience of this and, and how you eventually had to take the product off your store? Sure, sure. When the announcement was first made, uh, my traffic peaked around seven times its normal traffic. And um, within the first couple of days, I was, I was inundated with emails and text messages from customers or potential customers that were asking me if they could use this for human consumption. Um, when the announcement first came through and I saw the headline that said chlorican, immediately I took the product down. And the reason why I took that down is because I had a feeling that everyone was going to confuse chlorican for the product that I sold. Uh, because it's really easy with the headline where it says chlorican to make a link saying, well, if it's chlorican phosphate, if it's hydrochloricin, it's probably all the same thing. Let me try it. And how much product do you think you sold before you, you realized that this was the reason people were buying it? Well, I was selling my normal, um, my normal sales, which is about three to five orders a week. Um, there's not that many people who order from me since it's a very specialized medication. Um, but with me, I wanted to take it down right away because I was seeing eBay listings for this product go as high as $5,000. And this product normally would be anywhere from 30 to $70, depending on where you get it from. And it just didn't feel right to me that this was happening. It was, it was literal price gouging. And you've actually had abuse for taking your product down, haven't you? That's correct, yes. What kind of things have people said to you? Uh, I mean, there's stuff I probably can't say on the air for it. It's very verbally abusive. It's a lot of swear words. It's anger. It's some of it was saying that I was spreading misinformation because of something that Trump treated. It was just really, it was, I, th I think people are just desperate for things when people get sick and they were just looking for something that would work. Thanks, Mark. And Helena, this basically sparks a wider debate about whether politicians and research institutes should really be announcing the kind of drugs that they're researching for treatment of COVID-19 before they've really been approved. Right, absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Rory, and as well to you, Mark, sharing your insights with us so candidly. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Great to talk to you. But I think it makes a really important point about the risks of that kind of trickle down effect with inaccurate information at a time when people are desperate to you know cling on to that information you know particularly when their health their lives are on the line uh, marich i want to put that to you i mean about you know who do we trust in situations like this that's what it's about isn't it well, so I was very happy to hear how quickly Mark acted because that was really, uh, you know, clever, clever conclusion that that maybe people would make the connection uh, and that maybe he should be uh, precautious. I think there's also examples of people who have really thought the other direction and thought, how can I best gain economically from this? There was a a man in the United States who had bought up all the wipes, you know, the de disinfecting wipes and the antibacterial gels and tried to resell them on, on a platform like Amazon, for example. And we've seen price surges of uh, facial masks and others, which has then had a, had a bad effect on the, the doctors who needed it. So there's been a lot of bad behavior that we could, could see, but we also saw on the other, uh, on the other hand, a, I would say, um, new respect or new appreciation found for experts, uh, not only for experts in the medical field, uh, but also for the workers in hospitals, for the workers in our grocery stores. So uh, whereas it had been a big trend to attack experts, attack the elites, you know, this, this narrative that we so often hear from, from especially populist voices to say that like, you know, what are all these elites doing? They're hurting our societies. What, what are experts good for? We know better what the people want. I think this virus has really shown uh, the importance of listening to experts. Uh, and I think that those politicians who haven't, and we've seen quite a few of them, uh, and it's an ongoing um, problem, are also paying the price. I mean, there were, Boris Johnson himself was saying, I'm gonna to continue to shake hands, it's not a problem. You know, I would encourage you to shake hands. Uh, we've just found out that unfortunately, he himself has been diagnosed. Uh, and, and I wish him, you know, a quick recovery, but I think it shows that just to claim things about a, a disease that requires specialized knowledge uh, can have can have uh, bad consequences. And when leaders do it, they have a big audience. So it has a broader spread of bad impact.
Right, um, Ellie, I saw you nodding along and I do want to ask you about that as well because your monitoring uh, also encompasses other languages outside the Anglosphere. I mean, <laughs> what have you found? Uh, yeah, we're, we're monitoring in languages like Chinese and Tagalog, um, a, a range of particular at the moment Asian languages. Um, I think what we're seeing is mostly that that desperation of people to to find some answers. This is this is all very scary, um, and I think misinformation fills the spaces where people's answers uh, questions aren't getting answered. Essentially, um, what we're seeing and what we've seen in in Translations Without Borders work. Uh, in other major emergencies like uh, like the Ebola outbreak in Eastern DRC, for instance, is that you can't fill that space with fact um, unless you're speaking people's language. And that means both actually speaking the, the language that they understand, so, you know, Tagalog or Vietnamese or you know, any of the other several thousand languages on the planet, but also using terminology that makes sense to them. And I think we've really seen that we're all speaking a foreign language at the moment. This the terms like social distancing, I don't know about you, I'd never heard of it before COVID-19. Um, I think many other people hadn't. And my colleagues who are translating into you know, a vast number of other languages are saying, this is a real problem to get this concept across. Either it, you know, a, a Kenyan colleague was saying, you know, this idea of social distance in an African, most African cultures, it's it's pretty foreign. Um, how do we translate it? So in some cases, it will become you translate it literally, and then it becomes meaningless. Um, so one colleague told me that in Tagalog, it's it's being literally translated, and it means distancing yourself from society, which I don't think is really what anybody would in, would intend. Um, and others are saying, well, we're having to translate the idea as we understand it, which is you know keeping away from people, keeping your distance. Um, but I think the fact that when we use terminology that people don't, don't understand, we're not actually helping. And people continue to, to turn to the attractive, um, kind of idiomatic content that's out there on social media that, that speaks their language and that, that addresses their, their concerns right now. That's such a good point. And who ends up being the most vulnerable? To that kind of uh, attractive language or the scams out there or the misinformation in your experience? So th this is going a bit beyond social media because most of our learning around this in the recent past has been around the Ebola outbreak in Eastern DRC. Um, the people who don't, uh, who are less likely to have access to information anyway, um, are people who have less access to technology, less access to education, so they're less likely to be literate um, and when they, the language that they speak is marginalized in their own country, which is the case for, for many, many languages in the, uh, around the world, in the countries that we work in, um, they're, they're simply excluded, um, doubly excluded from the information. For instance, in, in the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, we found that older people, and particularly older women, uh, have, have less information about the virus than others. And some of that is down to language. Um, for instance, men that we, uh, that we interviewed were more likely to understand the word for epidemic and to understand the concept of an epidemic, um, whereas women uh, understood the same words to mean uh, diarrhea. So you've got a, a very serious risk of misunderstanding and miscommunication if you're not using the words that people understand for that particular concept. Guys, there is just so many layers to this. Um, I'm just wondering, kind of quick fire round, how do we solve this? How do we get past it? Well, one thing that's desperately needed is more research. And so we need access to information on um, what happens under the hood of the big tech companies. Everybody's online now. So there's unprecedented amounts of traffic going on. And I think it is crucial, it was before coronavirus, it is now, and it will be after coronavirus to understand much more of what was happening under the hood of these companies, because without access to information, it will be really hard to make evidence-based policies and to find solutions. And that in turn erodes uh, the trust and our ability to have, uh, have solid ground to stand on when we try to tackle this serious problem. Man, Leo, perhaps a thought from you. Yeah, uh, I, I, again, I totally, totally agree. And uh, 
that's why we started to collect this uh, um, incredible amount of, uh, of data. But um, look, I work at the Bruno Kessler Foundation. It's a, a leading research institution in Italy for artificial intelligence. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, we need further research about this, not only in, in the field of social science and, and so on, but also from a more technical perspective, because uh, it's uh, complicated to extract uh, narratives from online discussions. So it's, um, at least in an automated way, you still need humans going through the, through the tweets, through the messages, and uh, annotating uh, everything. But uh, one, while this can be done when the flow, the volume of information is reduced, say, I would say it's normal, uh, now it's impossible. We collect uh, up to five million tweets per day, but we miss, we know that we miss around 15, 20 millions uh, around the world. Mm. So it's an incredible amount of information that we miss. And uh, even if we had access to those data, like getting in touch with other research groups or Twitter itself, it would be incredibly difficult to track and analyze the narrative. So a lot of research is required on this side. Meanwhile, whilst we've got, you know, millions of tweets going out on a daily basis, then um, where should people go for information? You know, how should they be suspicious? How should they make sure that they inform themselves correctly, uh, briefly to anyone? So, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, so I think there are um, there are um, the World Health Organization on the global level. There are um, groups of doctors and um, uh, experts in the fields of viruses. There are policymakers that are responsible for implementing, you know, in a society what might be the right measure. So, for example, whether you are now in a lockdown or not in a lockdown is a combination of public policy and the governments responsible and the virologists who are informing that policy. So, I would say always look at a couple of resources of authoritative voices and then see you know the the pieces of the puzzle of uh, the facts that you need coming from different sides always and one of the challenges of that of course is making sure that that content is out there in the widest possible range of languages and in the formats that people are going to find accessible and of course that a lot of that goes beyond social media if you look at um, recent spikes in cases that you're getting some of the most rapid growth in countries with very low rates of literacy and so the communication has to go offline as well it needs to be radio broadcasts it needs to be audio audio visual content absolutely so important to consider as well um guys thank you so much for taking this time to hang out with me today for sharing your insights that's all we've got time for in this particular hangout but to everybody who is tuning in uh, thanks for your company do stay safe stay at home if you can and do stay connected as well I'll see you soon. Bye for now.